Sure. Thank you. Uh, first up, are there any declarations of pecuniary interest? Uh, Councilor Abel? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, 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 we've, I've noticed we brought up the tree bylaw again, and what I normally do uh, every time we bring this up is uh, tell everyone that I work at a golf course, but I have seeked legal advice, and I am not in any uh, pecuniary interest, so I will be part participating. Thank you, Councillor Abel. Seeing no other declarations, uh, may I have a motion to approve the agenda as amended? Councillor Peary, Councillor Tom, any questions, comments? Seeing none, all in favor? So moved. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Humphreys. So uh, first up, we have the determinations of items requiring separate discussion. I'll give Councillor Humphreys a quick second to settle in. And Councillor Gardner as well. I would, I would ask council that if you have the intention to pull the item regarding the tree bylaw, that I would hope that you would put forward an alternative at the outset for our discussions. Thank you. I'm gonna start on my right for items to be pulled. Councilor Maracas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, number 10. Councilor Gardner. Um. Do you mind coming back to me, please? Certainly. Mayor Daw? I'll pull 11. Councillor Abel? My two have been pulled, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Councillor Hump, Councillor Tom, okay. Councillor Kim? Uh, number three. Uh, Councillor Perry? That's right now, yeah. Sorry, just three? Councillor Perry. Councillor Gardner. Thank you. Do we have delegations for three and four? Uh, we certainly have a delegation for three. It's been pulled by Councillor Kim. We also have a delegation. And for four. And for item two. Uh, the mayor has pulled 11. 12, 12 and 13, please. 12 and 13. I'll repeat, so far we have item three pulled, item 10, 11, 12, and 13. Any other items council wishes pulled? Seeing none. May I have a motion to adopt those items not requiring separate discussion? Councillor Abel, Councillor Gardner, all in favor? So moved. Next up is delegations. Our first delegate tonight is uh, Joyce Deutsch. Well, hopefully I said that right. If not, please feel free to correct me. This item pass on consent. I appreciate you coming this evening. Just to remind you, you have five minutes and the item passed on consent, just so you know. Okay, thank you. Good evening, Mayor Daw and councillors and others. My name is Joyce Deitch and I reside at 22 Hawthorne Lane. Our request is that parking be allowed on only one side of the street on Hawthorne Lane. This request was brought forward to Jamal Masada on November 27th by Nancy Birch of 29 Hawthorne Lane. It was based on canvassing of the neighborhood by Nancy, but Nancy was unable to be here tonight, so I've been asked to, uh, to just speak on her behalf. Um, Nancy went to 27 houses on Hawthorne Lane. Uh, two were unoccupied and 25 are occupied at present. Of the 25 occupied houses, uh, 22 of them, which represents 88%, request parking on one side of the street. And the reasons why are because Hawthorne does not have any sidewalks and is a dead end. Parking on both sides of the street forced pedestrians to sometimes have to walk in the middle of the road um, to get by the parked vehicles. It's difficult to see the children and other pedestrians for the drivers of vehicles going by. And it is a safety hazard for pedestrians, especially children and seniors, etc. 
Additionally, there is a precedent on the adjacent street, which is called Hillview, which also does not have any sidewalks and is a dead end, and it has no parking on the north side of the street. Note the side for parking can be whichever side is allowable by uh, public works be, uh, due to fire hydrants. We've been told by Jamal that perhaps it has to be that um, the, the parking will be allowed on the south side because fire hydrants are located on the north side. The main point is that parking should be on one side only. Um, our thanks to Jamal for his help in guiding us through this process to make this request. And we hope that you will make the decision in favor of restricting parking to one side of the street on Hawthorne Lane. I have a copy of this uh, statement if you'd like me to leave it with you. You can leave it with Samantha, thank you. Thank you. And Ms. Deutsch, if you don't mind just staying at the podium for a minute. Can I have a motion to receive the delegate? Uh, Councillor Gardner, uh, Councillor Maracas, uh, any comments of the delegate? Councillor Humphreys. Thank you, you Mr. Thank you for coming this evening and expressing your concerns. And just to clarify, it has passed on consent, so Council agrees with uh, your delegation this evening, and staff is going to do some more you know, homework on the, on the issue. So thank you for bringing it forward. Oh, great. Thank you. Any other comments or questions for the delegate? Seeing none, thank you very much. Our next delegate this evening is, oh, sorry, all in favor? Carried. Our next delegate is Dr. Beverly Buford. Thank you, Buford. Thank you. If you don't mind just stating your name and address, and again, you have five yeah. minutes. Yeah, Dr. Beverly Buford, 317 Kennedy Street West, uh, Aurora. Uh, can I use some of her five minutes? Uh, in a 2011 petition from our neighbors for traffic calming measures, um, in 2011, a petition from our neighbors for traffic calming measures on Kennedy Street West was vetoed in this very chambers. The message that was received at the time, however, was very disheartening. You chose that street, suck it up. We went home and told our son that our concerns about he and his friend's safety on the road were not taken seriously our son propelled us to come again. We represent a household with direct uh, frontage on Kennedy West and Corner Ridge. We've lived in this great community for 15 years, although I grew up here in the 1960s on Young Street. The scope of the concerns from uh, the boots on the ground perspective um, is that Kennedy Street ranked on the traffic report um, from the traffic department uh, as one of the five selected traffic speed locations sampled that was in the 85th percentile. The number of cars driving over the posted 40 kilometer speed limit was uh, 12,300 in that sample. That's 88% of the motorists were driving over the 40 kilometer speed limit in the sample. Research has shown that at 32 kilometers an hour, the probability of a fatal or severe collision is only about 5%, I say only. When speed is increased to 48 kilometers per hour, the probability of a fatality is increased to 45%. When a pedestrian is hit at 64 kilometers an hour, the pedestrian has about an 85% chance of being killed. Would you want your child riding your bike, their bike on the street? Are we gonna wait until this statistic becomes our first childhood fatality on Kennedy Street West? The scope of the problem is clearly multifactorial. We had the widening of Bathurst Street. We had an additional subdivision of Deerhorn Crescent with 23 single family homes. That's about 85 people, another 46 vehicles. We had a development at Creeks Meadow at the corner of Murray Drive. We now have the proposed Highland Gate development that's going to bring, um, my understanding, 194 homes. And, um, we also have the presence of two local public schools, both of which generate high pedestrian and motorist, motorist traffic on Kennedy Street West. Aurora High alone has a population of over 1,200 students uh, and add in the recent merger of the George Street School. Furthermore, virtually 100% of our elementary school children in our neighborhood are bused. And most of those, many of those children get on and off of the bus where there is no sidewalk and are forced to walk on the road or on lawns to avoid oncoming traffic. There's literally a convoy of school buses in conflict with YRT buses and drivers returning from work. 
But the prime reason that we chose to live where we are is the presence of the Kennedy Street Park or playground. It's a pedestrian generator. The William Kennedy Park is the neighborhood central hub. It's the children's community center, if you will, where the kids go to play and hang out after school, regardless of which school they went to all day. Uh, the catchment area of the park is that it draws, it's the only community playground within one and a half to two kilometers. It's a pedestrian generator. It draws children, families, grandparents from surrounding streets, both east and west, primarily because the nearest playground is at either Confederation Park, that's at Regency Acres Park, or the Elizabeth Hayter Park behind the Aurora High, which is almost, which is 1.7 kilometers. The kids from Deerhorn Crescent are forced to cross Kennedy Street West. There's actually no stop sign for them. They cross Kennedy West in the speeding traffic in order to walk up to the park, then cross again at the intersection. And if they're lucky, the cars stop at the intersection to let them walk by. Now, when the babies and toddlers are going to the, the park in the strollers with their parents, they're quite well protected. But guess what? All those kids grow up, and as soon as they can, they want to ride their bikes independently to the park. They want to ride up and down to the creek and throw some stones in the creek at Murray Drive and ride oh, back over to Aurora High. Ms. Buffard, you have one minute left. Okay. Um, every day we ride our bikes several times over speed humps on Golf Links Road or Kennedy West before George Street. We see that these speed humps still exist despite them being the older types of outdated versions of speed humps and despite presumably EMS opposing their installation at the time. Given that the proposed speed cushions will have less interference with EMS vehicle response times than the older ones, we stand as champions for proposing you to consider to move forward with this pilot proposal and let the data speak. Are we not committed to creating a balance of increasing housing development with an efficient walk-friendly neighborhood, which is the heart and soul of a community, not just a mechanical collector road? These are children. This is their growing up life. This is their memories. After all, speed cushions are only a nuisance until it's your child's serious injury or worse yet, fatality. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Buffard. Can I have a motion to receive? If you don't mind just staying there, thank you. A motion to receive, uh, Councillor Maracas, Councillor Humphreys. Uh, any comments of the delegate, Councillor Humphreys? Thank you, you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you very much for coming this evening. And you remind me of somebody I know about 12 years ago. Uh, <laughs> did the same thing for golf links. Um, but I, I appreciate you coming forward tonight and expressing those concerns. And uh, I, just a question, have you got a signed petition from neighbors on your street already? No, we don't. We found out about this uh, proposal only recently. To be quite honest, I think we gave up. We were so disheartened at the last meeting. It was frankly quite offensive, some of the remarks that we received. Um, but I was not a delegate at that time. So I think we, most of the neighbors basically gave up and a lot have moved. Um, we can't do that with the kind of needs that our children have. Okay. Um, so and, no, we don't, but we understood that there would be, the next step would be a survey that would be sent out by mail to the right. residents. So just for your information, the town is planning to do a door-to-door -door, um, survey seeking for support in your neighborhood, and you need 70% of your neighbors to support it. Without that, you know, we're not going to mm -hmm. put speed bump. Yeah. So if there's some work that you and the neighbors do prior to that and do your own, I think that would help, depending yeah. on. Then, then we'll know what the you know what the team, the neighborhoods actually the really wanting from yes, a majority yes, perspective. Yes, I understood that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening. All in favor of receiving and referring to the item, carried. Our final delegation is Dr. Moore. And Dr. Moore, just to let you know, this also passed on consent. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening, Mr. Chair, Mayor Dawn, members of Council. My name is Brian Moore, and I'm the owner of the property at 15,000 uh, Young Street. As many of you know, the property recently underwent uh, renovation to enhance the ability of the property to, remain, to function as a, in a business capacity. And we'll move through here. I'm now requesting your assistance in completing this project by allowing signage that identifies to the members of this town the general and specialty services that are offered at this location. When two similar but different services are located in a single building, both need to be identified. As an example, general dentistry and orthodontics would both need distinct signage in order to convey their respective services. In the case of 15,000 Young Street, there is the general structural corrective services offered by the corporation Moore Chiropractic Group. 
and there is a specialty service of non-surgical disc herniation reduction offered by the Canadian Disc Institute. By having two signs on the property, this will allow both businesses to be separately represented. <clears throat> In my review of current bylaw, the proposed signed bylaw, as well as the promenade study, and the town's official plan, it is my understanding that Council has the discretion to issue a signed variance provided the general intent and purpose of the bylaw are maintained. Section 1.2 of the permanent signed bylaw states that the intent is to regulate permanent signs in relation to community appearance, safety, and the impact on the area. With regard to this application and when examining community appearance and relating to that to the promenade study, the intent of the bylaw is maintained with regard to characteristics allowed on heritage buildings, specifically in the areas of font, covers, and illumination. The promenade study suggests that a sign should not overwhelm the facade. The requested sign has been designed to fit into that area that will allow it to blend without overpowering the building. While most signs are mounted higher, that option was not available in this case as the building is all glass as designed uh, with the town and when the addition was designed. The promenade study also specifically mentions that any signage should not cover the, the windows and the glass and to put signage up at the standard height, the upper part of the windows would be covered. The study also desi desires that signage aid pedestrians and drivers in navigating the area. The requested sign will greatly help drivers in locating the building as they often have trouble identifying the building based on the ground signs as they are not large enough and certainly at the speed that the, tra the, um, the traffic is moving, it's difficult. Aesthetically, there are other signs of similar design with the within the town already, and we might refer to the Vandenbosch jewelry sign. In examining the impact on the community, and despite the R5 zoning, the area this sign would be located is in a very commercially zoned area, such as the neighboring property to the south and directly across the road. And as such, there are many buildings with multiple signs, and in fact, larger signs than what, what is being requested. As a result, there is no precedent being set as there are other R5 zone properties with this type and, uh, type and size of signage. And we might look at, um, at uh, the, well or the insurance building through here. The sign has been specifically designed to convey the desired message while not detracting from the aesthetics of the building and will not stand out in the community as an oddity as many, build as many buildings have multiple signs of various sizes and uh, styles. Additionally, many areas on the promenade study indicate that historical buildings need special consideration in certain areas such as parking and design freedoms. This building needs special consideration in the area of signage to allow it to blend in as opposed to having a small wall sign that looks out of place and is difficult for either pedestrians or drivers to read. Let's just see if this will... If one examines the... Um, Let's just see if I've got here. If one examines the second sign on the neighboring Pace building at 15,010 Young, you will see that the allowable 1.2 meter squared sign is not particularly legible in the position that it's in. Section 6.2E of the bylaw allows for the property to have two permanent signs. I'm requesting a variance to allow the second sign to be, lar to be a larger sign than the 1.25 meter squared in area currently provided for. The increase in size is required to allow proper visibility for the fast-moving traffic. Both signs are needed as mentioned previously, as the ground sign identifies the two businesses operating out of the property and the requested wall sign is designed to convey a message. These signs cannot be combined as the two businesses are separate and distinct services. In closing, I believe that the requested sign maintains the intent as set out in the bylaw and fits within many of the guidelines of the promenade study. I'm requesting your support to allow this variance to the bylaw. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Moore. Uh, I'll remind Council that this item was not pulled, and so the recommendation within the report was to deny the request, and so that... No, 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 no it was actually to approve it with conditions. My apologies. Yeah. It was to approve it with conditions? Yes. So perhaps we can take a moment just to clarify uh, what was passed on consent. Yes. The clerk's going to clarify. Thank you. Uh, uh, through you, Mr. Chair, the uh, General Committee's recommendation to Council on this item is that the report be received and that the request for a sign, uh, variance from the sign bylaw, uh, be approved on the following conditions. A heritage permit for the proposed sign is obtained from Planning Development Services prior to the issuance of the sign permit and the existing ground sign is removed as part of the sign permit. 
Thank you for the clarification. So that was passed on consent, Dr. Moore. I understand that. Questions of the delegate? Uh, first, we'll get a motion to receive. Councillor Maracas, Councillor Abel, uh, Councillor Maracas, Maracas, you're up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Three to delegate. Uh, thank you for coming, uh, Dr. Moore. I'm just wondering, are, are these recommendations, are you okay with the recommendations that have passed tonight on consent? Um, to, to have the ground sign removed, no. Okay. Um, I guess we, we might have made a little error and not a not one of us have pulled it and I think maybe next week one of us can hopefully pull this and we can discuss this and or can we waive procedure to bring this forward at some point can we do that with a two-thirds vote if council wishes we can waive procedural bylaw and pull this item I I think that we should do that if we can uh, under consideration of items yeah when we get into the considerations item after this one so um, if if it is the intent of council we will pull it and debate the item now Dr. Moore just so Thank you know Thank you, Mr. Chair. Councillor Humphreys. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you for coming this evening. And can I ask what in particular you're not pleased about with the sort of recommendations and conditions of that so that we're aware of your, so your the, concerns? The existing ground sign is, is fine. Uh, it, it seems that it's an either or. And the, by, the bylaws do allow us to have both signs there. All, we's at, all we've asked for is a, is a, a sl slightly smaller enlargement to the wall sign. So both signs are allowed. We just asked for a small enlargement onto the, the wall sign. Any further comments, questions? Councillor Abel? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Dr. Moore. Um, the, you showed some slides where there are two signs allowed. Yes. Do you mind just showing that for council, just because we're going to be debating it shortly? If we met, went to, this building is located right beside um, Baldwin's on uh, Wellington. So there's a ground sign here on this heritage building, and then a, um, I'm going to call it a wall sign on the side of the building here. Thank you. Any further comments or questions of the delegate? Councillor Tong? Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you for coming out. Uh, my only question is uh, the condition that you're not, uh, that you're opposed to is simply that you'd like to have both signs. Correct. The heritage permit, you, you don't have an issue with that? No. Thank you. Councillor Perry. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and through you to uh, Dr. Moore. Looking at the placement of the sign that you're proposing as well as the sign that's currently in place, um, I see sight line issues in that if you're driving southbound, you're going to see one sign and it's going to hide the other sign. Correct. Um, that's not an ideal solution in my view. Would it make more sense or, or would you feel better about having two separate similar signs put, um, you know, moving this one over so that both, scenes, both signs can be visible at the same time? That to me sounds like a much more viable option. I'm not opposed to you having two signs on, on site, but to have one sign that blocks the other sign doesn't make sense to me. And we're certainly open to that. Okay, thank you. If there's no further comments or questions from council, um, all in favor of receiving and referring? Carried, thank you very much. Thank you. We will now move on to, there are no presentations by the advisory committee chairs, I assume. Looking, I see none. We'll move on to considerations of items requiring separate discussion before we pick a specific item. Does a member of council want to move uh, the waiver? Councillor Maracas, seconded. Councillor Humphreys, uh, we need two thirds to waive procedural bylaw to allow that item to be pulled for discussion. All those in favor? So moved. We will add item two to the discussion. And Council, I suggest, although a fair number of people in the audience are here for the, uh, the tennis item, uh, we had two delegates, so we'll proceed in order, item two and item three, which were the delegations, and then deal with the, uh, the tennis issue. First up is item two. Councillor Maracas. Uh, Mr. Chair, I can't move it the way it is. So. Uh, would anybody like to put forward the staff recommendation? Councillor Tom, seconded by Councillor Peary. Councillor Tom, would you like to speak to it? I think I'll let uh, Councillor Maracas start us off. Councillor Peary, did you want to speak? 
So briefly, I've, I've uh, listed my concerns with moving forward as we're <coughs> going if we do remove the second clause. I think it makes more sense to have two signs. They can be a similar size and scope on the same building um, so it doesn't interfere one with the other. It makes sense to me. Um, it's better for business in my view. It cleans things up in my view. That would be my preference. Um, I don't know if we should send that back to staff as is, but I, I think that's the better option than to have two signs that are perpendicular to each other on the same plane. I have Councilor Maracas and Councilor Gardner, then Councilor Abel, then Councilor Daw. Well, sorry, my apologies. Mayor Daw, I was rolling on the Councilor piece. I do apologize. <laughs> Councilor Maracas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I'll just be quick. Uh, I think we should, I mean, I'd like to remove that second clause. Um, I don't see any issue with having the two signs there. And I think if the, you know, if Dr. Moore is okay with the placement of where it is right now and it's already existing, well then, if he's fine with it blocking the one, then it's fine with me. And if it's gonna have the heritage aspect to it, I'm good with that also. So if we can just remove that second clause, I'd be all for moving forward. Councilor Gardner. Thank you. Uh, this came to the Heritage Committee and some of the comments there were that, uh, and it's in the report, page two, the committee expressed concerns regarding the number of signs on the property, the size of the proposed wall sign, the size of the variance, and setting a precedent. And my particular issue is setting a precedent. We have businesses along that uh, strip that have the, the sign, uh, I don't, I don't know if it's perpendicular or parallel. I think it's perpendicular to the street. Um, and now, uh, if we allow this particular business to have a perpendicular and a horizontal sign on the building, we'll be setting a precedent, and I don't think it's appropriate. Um, I would like to hear from our Director of Building and Bylaw, though. Ms. Van Leeuwen. Through you, Mr. Chair. Um, we took the comments from both the Economic uh, Development Advisory Committee and the Heritage Advisory Committee, and we took those into consideration uh, when looking at this variance. Um, the wall sign is three times the uh, permitted sign area. Um, if, the, uh, if Dr. Moore wanted to decrease the size of sign, um, that is something to consider, or as uh, Councillor Perry, Perry su suggested, have two wall signs uh, parallel to the building. Perhaps um, that is something to consider as well. Thank you for clarification. Um, maybe you could have asked Councillor Perry, but two wall signs, but within this, the same footprint as the one sign that is now shown? Because that sign already has a variance, a pretty large variance. I, I mean, it depends what Councillor Peary uh, means with respect to two signs, but if they're in the same footprint as the variance that we've approved, that's fine. Um, actually, I agree with the staff report. I think that one sign on that building is what we should approve. Uh, I think it's a heritage area. It's a, I know it's a mixed up area right now, but we want it to become a particular looking area and I think that allowing two signs is not really what is best for the future of the area. Councillor Abel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and I spoke to this months ago when we were doing the bylaw. I, I had asked staff to consider my comments, and that was that mm -hmm. on the promenade heritage buildings, if we are evolving a business-like strategy uh, to retain and uh, bring business to our downtown and they're professional and and I was hoping that we would have had some sort of consideration at that time put into the new bylaw however that not being the case uh, it's free for variances and for uh, people to come forward uh, we did discuss uh, as it says on page two in the economic development advisory committee that we should consider um, alternates of trying to help uh, businesses, as, I, as I've just said, and this is done in a most um, professional and, and tasteful manner. It acknowledges and uh, allows for the heritage. 
And um, so that's why I think the economic development uh, fully supported it. I sat on Heritage last uh, term. Uh, it was great. Uh, I learned a great deal. Uh, and I feel very comfortable that the heritage uh, on all the buildings on Wellington, especially Wellington, are being uh, uh, valued and adhered to. So I'm in full support of this. I was before. I'm, I'm still asking that by law or through maybe the BIA that we're going to bring forward or through economic development, start looking at how we're going to uh, rejuvenate and maintain businesses along our promenade. If it's a heritage building and they want to put a sign down below, as Dr. Moore has done patiently here, uh, he's been months before us, um, and he puts it nice and low on a border, I think it's excellent. I, I don't want to create barriers, and, and, uh, and you can see that there's other places that are already doing it, and I, and I have no problem with that. So it's not a precedent, uh, it's just that uh, someone went and did it and didn't ask for permission, and Dr. Moore did, and went to all the committees, and he's, he's now being the one that's being told that one sign is enough. I, I respect his, uh, his judgment, because uh, his building is beautiful. It's, a, it's an excellent uh, profession he has there. If he likes his two signs where they are and one blocks the other, I'll leave it with him. Uh, I th and, and I'm not going to say that he has to do it that way. I'm in full support of doing this. I think it shows the businesses on Young Street uh, that we do value their, their, the buildings and their investment in our community and, and, and preserving our heritage. Yes, Young Street is a mishmash because across the street is a strip plaza and they're allowed signs uh, all over and bigger because they're commercial. So we have to allow for some sort of balance and this is a good balance in my opinion. So I would, uh, as Councillor Maracas has suggested, remove that last clause and Mr. Moore has been before this council for months now on several occasions. Let's let him get on with his business and settle this issue right away. Thank you, Councillor Abel. As a reminder, we can split those, uh, those subsections and vote on them separately, if so chosen. Mayor Dahl. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I will support the staff recommendation. We did send it back to uh, the Heritage and um, EDAC for their comments. Uh, and so I will go with the comments of the Heritage Committee. Uh, I can appreciate uh, that it's not perhaps a popular decision, but uh, we are trying to move forward on a specific look in that area. So I will support the staff recommendation. Thank you, Mayor Dahl. I will now move to this side of the table. I have, I have Councillor Kim, then Councillor Tom, Councillor Humphreys, and then Councillor Perry for the second time. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I, have, I have no problems with the... Uh, with removing the second clause, as for Councillor Maracas, I, I believe that uh, Dr. Moore has, has done more than his fair share of, of uh, cleaning up the, uh, the Heritage Building and and really making it, uh, bringing it up to uh, to various standards and making it aesthetically pleasing. He spent uh, you know quite a bit of money on it, and I think I think what's you know, heritage is important, but I do believe that, you know, business development and economic prosperity uh, in our central core area um, trumps that. Uh, to a certain degree, there has to be a, a form of self-regulation, and I think it, it's, it's, it's in the best interest of business owners to make the street in front of them and their facade to be aesthetically pleasing. Otherwise, people don't want to, to walk on the street. So I think there's, uh, you know, there has to be some kind of self-regulation, and I think uh, when there's too much regulation, I think it, it does a disservice to uh, residents and the business people. So uh, I, would, I would be fully in support of removing the second clause and uh, perhaps uh, voting on those two clauses separately. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Kim. I'll move next to Councillor Tom. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So um, I chair the Heritage Committee, and uh, in the report it discusses what uh, transpired there and that the Heritage Committee uh, received their report for information and took no action. Their, re their recommendation, they didn't have a recommendation. So the comments that were talked about around the table when this item came up, uh, it was my understanding that the, and the Heritage Committee was not unanimous. Uh, but uh, the heritage aspect actually was kind of not really discussed. And what was, what was discussed at Heritage was the sign bylaw. Um, it wasn't an, ob an objection to, to uh, on it from a heritage standpoint, but an objection by the Heritage Committee on the sign bylaw. 
and that's why it was defeated. Uh, so the recommendation was to receive for information. My opinion is, you know, the, the sign bylaw allows two signs. This is really a variance for the size of the sign. We're asking, he's asking, the, the delegate is asking for a, a increase in the size, that's the variance. And in doing that, he spent, as Councillor Abel mentioned, months in front of council, two committees, and uh, has agreed to get a, or you know, will agree to get a heritage permit, as he said. He has no objection to getting a heritage permit. So to me, it's, why are we holding them up any further? It's a, it's a business that's trying to rejuvenate our downtown, our, our promenade area. And uh, other businesses have gotten two signs and our sign by law allows it. It just, he needs a, a size increase. So to me, I, I don't see the, the need to, to have him remove the, the ground sign. I think it's a bit outrageous. And secondly, if you look across the street, M&M's Meat Shops has a perpendicular sign, two perpendicular signs. They got one above their shop and they got one on the street. It's the same thing. It's literally right across the road. So I don't understand the problem, but you know, I guess there have been stranger things. So I will, I will uh, support uh, uh, the, the, the first clause and uh, uh, if they're split, uh, I'll, I'll remove the second or vote against the second. Thank you. Councillor Humphreys. I'll just keep it brief, Mr. Chair. Just uh, I'm I'm supportive of the, of the motion uh, brought forward, and I I just wanted to comment that the building itself is is beautiful and it's outstanding and it, and it's absolutely notable on Young Street. So I won't even look at the sign. I just look at the building and it's uh, it's lovely. So I, I again I support the the, the the amendment. Thank you, Councillor Perry, for the second time. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would argue it's very different than across the street. Uh, there's less than a meter between the sidewalk and and where this between the building and where the sign is. All I'm saying is I, I'm in complete agreement that two signs make sense for the property. Um, it doesn't make sense to have one sign block the other sign, and I disagree with the statement that if, uh, doc, if the applicant is, is okay with that, then I'm okay with that. We have to be stewards of the downtown core. We have to make sure that things work and are aesthetically pleasing. Um, and this doesn't work in that capacity, you know, I want the applicant to have, um, I think, two signs on the site, whether they're a little bit larger um, than what our, our bylaw would state, makes sense. I don't see why somebody would, would want to put one sign in front of another sign uh, for two separate businesses. It just it doesn't make sense to me. I agree that, that two signs need to be on site because two different businesses operate there. I just think it makes more sense to have them side by side instead of in front of each other. Thank you, Councillor Perry. Seeing no further discussion, I will uh, ask if Council would like to split this as, uh, as previously mentioned. Moved by Councillor Abel. We don't actually move. So we'll just vote on the very first clause that the report be received. All those in favor? Carried. On the second clause, the first point that a heritage permit be obtained. All those in favor? Opposed? That carries. And on the second piece, that the existing ground sign be removed. All those in favor? Opposed? That part fails. Thank you for coming, Dr. Moore. We'll now move to item three. Item three was pulled by Councillor Kim. Councillor Kim, would you care to put the staff recommendation on the floor? Yes, I'd like to uh, move as is, please. Thank you. Do I have a seconder? <coughs> Councillor Perry, Councillor Kim, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ms. Mr. Chair. Um, I just wanted to, uh, I, when I was reading the report, I had uh, one or two questions, and I'm sure others who read it uh, had the same questions. And I did obtain clarification from uh, Mr. Simonoskis earlier today, but just for, excuse me, the interest of um, the public and other members of council, who might have had the same questions. Uh, through, through you, Mr. Uh, Chair, to Mr. Simonoskis, um, it states on page three of, of the item, an estimated 1,410 notification letters will be required to cover the proposed nation uh, locations and uh, will need 70% uh, uh, acceptance of the, the, the speed cushions to move forward. Uh, so if you were to divide that by the five streets and neighborhoods 
in question, uh, would they be evenly, uh, is it fair to say it's going to be evenly divided, 14, 10, divided by 5, or is it, uh, if you can speak to that, that'd be great. Mr. Timonopsis. Uh, certainly uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, it'll be roughly one-fifth of that number. It's based on the location of the um, speed cushions and the length of the road. So each area is going to be a little different. Some may, may be a little higher count. Some may be a little lower count. And it's based on, on the policy that we have with regards to defining what the um, service area is to achieve that 70% support. So uh, staff have done those calculations. I, I uh, was trying to keep this, the report, uh, I guess, a little uh, cleaner. But for each section, we have identified a geographic area of, of which homes will be surveyed, and that total count is what comes up to 1,410. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So uh, in our communication between two, uh, roughly 250 to 30 residents per neighborhood, and out of that 70 percent, we'll have to uh, give approval. Correct, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, And in terms of uh, the mailing, uh, is, is it uh, have we firmed that up? That's going to be through a mailing, or is there going to be? Through, is there a, a less expensive way? I'm, I think like a stamp now is uh, just just to be uh, cost conscious, probably like a buck twenty-five or buck fifty for uh, local. It's a couple thousand dollars for to send these out. Are, is there a more uh, cost-effective uh, way to implement that, Mr. Simonovskis? Through you, Mr. Chair. Typically, we will send staff to do a hand a door-to-door. -door. Um, delivery, so it'll be our staff who will walk through the communities. And lastly, you know, I'm, uh, you know, if if you didn't have children, you and you're a different stage of life, you might have a different view of speed humps. I guess I'm in that same stage where I do have children and I do have those concerns. But uh, I think most of us, even if you are not in that stage of life, you're you're concerned about other people's children's. Um, and I know that you have to weigh both risks. And, uh, the presenter uh, said that there are, you know, increased risk when you increase the speed uh, of of vehicles that are going through the uh, the roads. And at the same time, you have the emergency uh, service providers who also tell us that there's an increased risk when they're 30 seconds behind. Uh, you know, when you're trying to get to. Uh, a uh, person that is uh, ill or there's a fire but uh, I think you know when I weigh those t those two I think that uh, the increased risk is not to have speed bumps or speed cushions um, but you know whatever you know it's it's these decisions are are you know rightly at the hands of the residents and so whatever the residents uh, will support uh, I will support and uh, thank you Mr. Simonaskis for bringing this forward and moving this forward. Councilor Abel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, of course, uh, we all want the streets to be safe, and we know everyone's in a rush. Uh, there, uh, I just, I, the term, and, and I think it's really important, um, Mr. Chair, that we understand what it is. It's a cushion rather than a hump, and and people have all kinds of visions of what it is. Uh, is it the big, thick? eight inch high that you have to roll over and your undercarriage and muffler get ripped off? Or is it the nice gentle cushion uh, that is on Golf Links Road um, with, a, with a, a slice in the middle so uh, emergency vehicles can move right through and not even go over them? Uh, I sit on JCC with you, uh, Mr. Chair and, and Councilor Maracas, and uh, we can ask the chief that if, if, if they had their dithers and, and it moved through a cushion, and that's what we're talking about, they could still make their speeds and their timelines, uh, which is six minutes to answer a call. The, um, the concern I have is the lack of response from residents. And, and so I think if residents know that there is uh, a survey coming forward, that they'll participate in it if it's easy. And so we know that if we put something on a notice board and ask them to come to town hall or something to talk, very few people come. Uh, but we also notice that if you go door to door with a mailer, like we saw with the uh, Highland Gate Residents Association, or we did with the community garden, and you go door to door, you get a much better response. So I'm not entirely confident in the mail service. I would prefer door to door. Um, but we'll leave that up to captains in each area to make sure everyone looks at their mail. Um, 
but will we also support it with communications on notice boards, our social media, our website, that there is something very important and it, it, it involves community safety and traffic concerns, which I think warrants uh, that attention to support the mail out. Check your mail, an important survey coming to high volume traffic areas about safety concerns so that people will know and how to respond. So through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, excuse me, uh, not yet, uh, Mr. Chair, um, if I could ask the director, would that be all in, in as well? And uh, maybe Mr. CAO would like to comment as well. Uh, I'll direct it first to Mr. Simonovskis. Certainly through you, Mr. Chair. Yes, we would, we would notify. Uh, anytime we try to reach out to the public, we do as much uh, uh, communication channel outreach as we can. So with this, definitely, we'll have uh, um, our social media network or, or tools activated, as well as a door-to-door. -door. And uh, really, what we're trying to do, the policy requires that the community generate the survey results. And what we're suggesting here to facilitate the council's direction with moving forward with these five locations is we'll have our staff actually go out, distribute those, those surveys, and hope, hopefully help facilitate the, uh, the feedback process. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Simonoskis. I appreciate that. Yeah. Members of council, any other questions? Um, I have one. Uh, Mr. Simonoskis, with respect to the mail outs, can you just be a little bit more specific in terms of who is actually receiving those? Is it just those residents that live uh, adjacent to where the speed uh, cushions are going to go, or are we also going to spread it to the uh, the adjacent streets around the area? Yes, certainly to you, to you Mr. Chair. It's generally focused on the street with uh, with on which the uh, the change or the the modification is occurring. So that is the focus of the of the distribution. Um, there may be certain areas, depending on the configuration, where we reach out a little bit into the side streets. Uh, as I mentioned, staff have tried to delineate areas that c make sense for each of the configurations. Some of the straight through streets, such as Kennedy, uh, the primary impact is on those those local residents. Whereas there's some areas where we have um, more schools and more sort of uh, infiltration streets. So we've tried to create a, a communication plan that's going to be more broad. Of course, uh, through the public distribution and the, and the uh, notice board information, anyone who wants to comment can comment as well, and we'd be glad for that feedback. Uh, and we also do want to, as, as uh, uh, just if I could add, Councillor Abel's comment on what is actually being proposed. We do want to identify on the survey what the speed hump uh, cushion looks like and a location of an example of what would go on so that there's some, some, um, some visual as to what you're actually going to be receiving. I appreciate that. You know, for myself, I would like to see it more like our public planning process where you take it sort of from a radius of where it is. I know for Stone Road, Conover, Mavernack, there are a number of adjacent streets and the only way to get to them is to go over those sections of road. So, you know, in, in my view, it impacts those that live on those adjacent streets just as much as those that live uh, on it. And so I think there is value in expanding the circle in terms of the mail outs and the surveys just to get uh, significant feedback on it. But that's my perspective. I have Councillor Humphreys and then Councillor uh, Maracas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And to your point, um, it's critical that the adjacent streets get engaged because when people want to avoid those streets with uh, speed um, controlling methods, they're going to try alternate streets and other streets will get the fallout of the traffic calming measures and that was a really uh, large process with the whole traffic warrant um, regulations and I know that at the time when, when we were engaged there was a traffic advisory board here and it was a very um, strong process in communication and everyone had a door-to-door -door knock and uh, hand it over on the survey and people would come in support of or not support because of how they're going to see traffic flowing once you do that. So you have to be very careful in the adjacent streets, just as important as the ones um, I believe the residents getting those speed cushions on their street for safety. So um, I think there's a whole policy on communication for this type of traffic um, process. And I think we should really look at that very closely and make sure it gets done well. Because we're going ahead and doing a lot of uh, safety measures got to understand what the traffic impact is going to be when we do that. Thank you, Councillor Humphreys. I have Councillor Maracas next. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, 
I agree with uh, some of the councillors' comments that I would like to see a, a wider net cast out as far as uh, the consultation piece. Um, also through you, Mr. Chair, to Mr. Sonovskis, I just want to clarify and make sure we're, we're not doing anything tonight as far as approving speed cushions. We're just looking to approve direction to do the consultation piece. Is that correct? Mr. Simonoskis? Yes, sir, Mr. Chair, that's correct. It's just a consultation piece. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Abel, if it's okay with you, Councillor Kim would like to speak for the first time. Thank you. Councillor Kim? My apologies, then. I will go back to Councillor Abel, then, for a second time for yourself. The floor is yours, Councillor Kim. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I just, I just want to bring up a quick point, or um, it's just kind of anecdotal, but I, I, I do understand the, the potential need to um, expand the, the survey uh, petitioning outside of the, uh, just the, the main road that's impacted. But my fear is that those who are the offenders, the speeders, are coming from the arterial roads that feed into the main street. And so I'm wondering whether they might skew the results to the point, uh, to the point where they do, uh, most uh, feeder road residents may not want the speed bumps, whereas those who actually live on the road where everyone's speeding um, may be more, uh, have a higher propensity to want to have the speed bumps. So uh, that would be my only concern. And uh, I'm not sure if, if there's any provincial or any kind of York region report that uh, would speak to that. But if it doesn't, I think if you could carefully consider that so that uh, uh, I think the biggest impact would be on those residents who live on the, the offending streets. Thank you. Councillor Abel. Thank you. It's a good point, uh, Councillor Kim. Uh, most people that speed by my house are the, live up the road. They're my neighbors. Um, and they may say, hey, I, I got no problem. Um, so. If I understood, Councillor Kim asked, uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, Councillor Kim asked if there was some 250 people going to be surveyed in each of these five spots. Did I, did I hear that right? Ask us. Was that the number? Through you, Mr., uh, Mr. Chair. So it's roughly one-fifth of that total number. Each area is a little different in size. Some may be a little higher, some may be a little lower. So how many would you be sending out in each area? About, uh, about about one fifth of that, about 200. Well, I, th I think that speaks one fifth of 250? Uh, 1,400. Okay, so like, when I look at a street, if I look at a speed hump, I'm looking at 10 houses on each side. That's 20. So if you're going to go 200, that means you're going well into the neighborhoods. Uh, and so I'm, I'm satisfied that the concerns have been addressed so just by that sheer number. That metric alone tells me that there's a lot of houses. I delivered uh, a lot of election signs, and I know what 250 feels like. That's about eight streets, um, big streets. The, and I, I like the word about impact. The impact of these speed humps is that people are going to have to slow down to the speed limit because the speed cushion allows you to roll over at the speed limit. So it would be the same as putting, say, a police car at each place where you want to slow the traffic to the speed limit. And the impact would be of the police car with a radar gun, you would slow to the, to the speed. And that's exactly what a soft cushion does. It slows the speed to the speed limit. So there's really no impact except you're obeying the law. Uh, those that want to uh, find an alternate route to speed, um, I mean, I mean, it's possible, but most of the collector will be coming into the house, so I, I don't see... Um, so again, I think council, we, have to, we have to identify what it is. Councillor Humphreys is saying it's a big roller coaster. And, and if you go along Golf Links Road, uh, well, then you're fine. And I've never heard one complaint about Golf Links Councilors, Road. Councillor Abel has the floor. So a very good point, because uh, Councillor Humphreys used to live on Golf Links Road, and I travel it all the time. Um, because at the, at the speed limit, because you have to. And you, you coast at 45 clicks and you go over the hump and you, and you go along at the speed. If you didn't, I could roar down there, as people will do on fairway, at 70, 80 clicks. And that's what we're concerned about. So, uh, I, one more point, uh, Mr. Chair. There was some rehabilitation work done on Center Street, and when they put the paving down, 
they did put the speed humps back, and we got two calls. I got two calls right away. I relayed to the uh, Mr. Simonovskis right away. Center, just a little small place. Could you please put those speed cushions back in because the traffic is roaring down out of the GO station? And they're there, and now people have to go 40 kilometers an hour in a pedestrian, uh, in a residential area, and that's all we want to do. It'd be the same as putting a police car there. So we're not trying to stop or break people's up for their, their suspensions. And we just want to calm the traffic. Thank you, Councillor Abel. Councillor Gartner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, we have a, an unusual situation here. Um, and I think it arose because when we were doing our election door to doors, a lot of us met people in neighborhoods that were very unhappy with the, the way the traffic was flowing in the area and it was flowing too fast, they thought. So usually warrant one happens when a petition is brought in by the resident and um, that didn't happen in this case. This is this initiated from a council motion. So the other thing about warrant one is uh, impact to adjacent, adjacent streets. Should the department decide that the proposal is going to affect the adjacent, adjacent streets, then they um, they can modify the study area. So through you to uh, Mr. Chair, to Mr. Simonovskis, in the area of Stone Road, there aren't that many adjacent streets. There, mo it's, a, it's a long straightaway. Um, Kennedy, uh, I'm not sure. There's not a lot of adjacent streets. But, but uh, so how would you fulfill the, the spirit of Warrant 1 as this is such a different situation? We are not going to need um, a petition from the residents. Mr. Simonovskis? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, I, I think if I could propose bringing or submitting, we have all the maps laid out where, where each mail out is going to occur. I'd be happy to submit that information to council so that each councillor can see exactly where the mail outs will go and then that information can be available for for tomorrow and being brought back for discussion next week if because what i'm sensing <coughs> is there's a lot of concern as to which homes and streets will be included in the survey and right now the conversation isn't very helpful from a lack of information <laughs> perspective if that if that's fair enough to say it's a great suggestion thank you mr simonoskis anything further councillor gardner Thank you, Mr. Simnos. It sounds great to me, and um, I'll be glad to have it for the council meeting. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Peary is next. I just want to remind everybody that we're just having a motion here to direct staff to conduct a public consultation. Councillor Peary, the floor is yours. Mr. Ma uh, Mr. Chair, you're, you're reading my mind. Uh, we've gone around the table. Everybody's agreed with the recommendation in front of us. I'm not sure going around to speak more times is going to get us any further on our discussion if we've already agreed on what we have in front of us, so I'll call the question, please. All those in favor of calling the question? So moved. All those in favor of the motion in front of us? Carried. We will now move to item 10. I believe that was pulled by Councillor Maracas. <coughs> Councillor Maracas, would you care to put the recommendation on the floor? I'll move as is. As is, seconded by Councillor Abel. Councillor Maracas, you're, on the floor. you're up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, once again, I'll be very quick. Um, I think we should just move forward. Uh, this should have been done a long time ago, I think, and we're going to be providing a service that is needed, and it's not costing the taxpayers any money, so I don't really see what the issues would be moving forward, so I, I'm in full support of it. Councillor Abel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, I, perhaps I'll put a, 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 an amendment on the floor. Uh, I have concerns with the location. Um, I think this is our prime uh, Sark uh, Park. Uh, I'll call it a recreational park. Um, if we uh, lease out a bubble for 20 years, if we ever have any mind to repurpose for any reason, we will not be able to do so. Uh, I would suggest uh, that we put a bubble up like they do in Newmarket uh, by the same company where they, at the end of the summer, they put a bubble over the tennis courts and when spring comes, they take the bubble off. It's operated by the same company, as I said. That's the solution he does in Newmarket. We could put a bubble over Fleury Park in the fall and take it off uh, in the spring. 
So uh, if that's to satisfy the immediate need, it would be cheaper investment for uh, the proposal because he doesn't have to grade the land or, or put the courts down. And then we could use that valuable asset of land that we have at the SARC for what our master plan says, what our sport tourism says, and that's a multi-purpose facility that could put tennis courts, volleyball courts, basketball courts, indoor track, indoor soccer, badminton, all those things in one facility. Uh, we could hold tournaments and we could all put it at the SARC, and I think that's what our master plan says. So I think um, uh, we answer two things uh, with an amendment such as that. Uh, one, we can continue on with the uh, multi-purpose uh, facility that we so dearly need. Uh, and two, it satisfies the need uh, for a bubble that council in four years, because remember it was the uh, Aurora Communities Tennis Association that came forward four years ago with an idea of a multi-purpose. And so uh, I won't go through the frustration of uh, all the repeat. We have asked for six times for a multi-purpose facility for council to consider as an option and we still haven't got that. Um, we could put a bubble on the Hallmark lands. We could put it on Mavernack. I don't know. Not, I do not know why we would let this very um, strategic, valuable piece of land on the SART be occupied by a bubble. So, um, Mr. Chair, I would, I would say let's put a bubble over Fleury Park, get the indoor soccer looked after, and then we can continue on with our master plan. Councillor Abel, is that your amendment? That is that is my amendment, that we would uh, ask uh, that the staff uh, would engage with the uh, proponent for a bubble over Fleury Park, as they do in Newmarket, and that staff be directed to come back with a multi-purpose facility at the Sark lands, as, and we've asked that a number of times, so I would re-ask that. Thank you. I'm just going to go to the clerk first to make sure that that amendment is in order and not contrary to the main motion. Uh, thank you. I apologize for the delay, uh, Mr. Chair. The amendment would be in order, to, if I understand correctly, that the, the second clause would be the SAPI director to prepare a lease agreement with uh, Ontario Inc. for the British indoor tennis facility at Fleury Park. Um, that amendment itself would be in order. Uh, the results of it would be different. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Do I have a seconder for the amendment by Councillor Abel? Uh, Councillor Gardner is seconding that amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I am seconding the idea of that amendment, um, but I'm not sure whether we can do it within this frame of reference. We can certainly add, uh, seek uh, direction from staff, but for now, we're just looking to second the amendment to begin the debate. Councillor Abel, did you have anything further you'd like to add to your amendment? Yes, um, Mr. Chair, I would ask that we do it as a five-year lease. Um, that way we're not committed in a long term. And my comment to that, Mr. Clerk, did you want to say something? Okay. Um, like a shorter lease, so I, I, I would negotiate it. Uh, we have uh, at the soccer club, in case we make a, a mistake, um, at the soccer dome, as we made a 20-year lease and we forgot to tell the proponent to pay the taxes. So that's why you want to go slowly on these sort of ideas. Uh, it's, it's very distracting, no problem. Um, so my, my basic feeling is, is uh, we dropped the ball on this. It's been four years. Um, well, the town did. Uh, we failed the tennis community. Uh, they came to us uh, in 2012 with an idea to coincide with our 150th anniversary. And uh, I thought it was a great idea. Um, I checked Tennis Canada, and Tennis Canada gives a, a whole um, format for indoor facilities. Uh, they, tennis is growing in our country. It's affordable. Um, it's a healthy, it's a healthy sport, and um, 
I think we should have addressed it and done something in partnership with an organization. And that's what Tennis Canada says. Work with, a, a, with a, a, or an organization and move forward. So we didn't do that. And um, we came up with a bubble, which is a solution, but a bubble, no one plays tennis indoors in a bubble. There's nothing attractive about playing in a bubble. Uh, it's better to play outside. It's, you know, you could go skiing indoors, but it's better to go outside. Uh, so I, I think what I, and I talked to the president of the New Market Tennis Association, and they told me that what they do is they cover up a few of their courts. And uh, that, that provides that service in lieu until you get a proper multi-purpose indoor facility. Um, that will do the job. It will satisfy the need for, uh, for play in the winter time uh, without a long-term commitment. I do have concerns about, again, that land leasing it for 20 years at less than $1,000 a month. Uh, that's a great deal for the person that operates it and puts the bubble up, but I don't think it helps us if we ever want to repurpose it or need that land because then we're in, locked into a long-term lease. And we've seen what that can be because we forgot to have taxes on the soccer dome and we can't renegotiate that. We have to see that to the full term. So uh, there's a bit of a risk factor getting involved in a long-term lease on such a, a, a valuable piece of property. I think with sport tourism, Mr. Chair, and I said it already, uh, they want to see tournaments. We want to provide a facility like that. Uh, we haven't considered other locations like Hallmark or Mavernack or our Leslie Street lands, I think at the very least we should move slowly, we can find a very quick fix for five years and then address the situation. So, I mean, I, I think it's, those are my thoughts on that. Thank you, Councillor Abel, and, and, and I hear your concerns. I'm also hearing from staff that there may be some, some legal or administrative issues. So before we engage too far in the debate, uh, I'd like to go to staff to get some clarification around the amendment and, and the change in process here. Um, I'm not sure if it's best directed to, to uh, Mr. Downey or perhaps um, uh, our CAO would like to, to comment on it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll take a first stab at it, um, but I have the, the uh, smallest amount of history on this file, so I'm uh, a bit of a loss and I'll refer to other staff. I'm just... Uh, my sense is, and I'll, I'll look to uh, some legal support and, uh, and perhaps uh, the clerk, it may be uh, easier to just turn this down and give us uh, staff direction to explore another option as opposed to mess around with, with uh, this option or this motion as it's, as it's presented. Uh, this was designed to be a kind of a straightforward lease for a piece of land that we know about and there's a couple of variables coming here with the location. Uh, uh, a different type of structure that would come down uh, within the seasons, so it may be more appropriate to draft something different and bring it back in another form if council doesn't like the option that's before you. But I'd uh, defer to legal or to clerks if there's anything else you would add. Who'd like to weigh in? Um, I think I would concur with the comments of the CAO. Uh, the recommendations before council are with respect to the proposal to put the bubble at the, the specified location. Um, so if we wanted to look at other options, I think uh, it would be best to uh, have staff uh, explore that and bring it back to council. Thank you. Anything, anything further from Mr. Downey? No, I see none. Thank you. I'll now go back to the members of council. I have uh, Councillor Peary mm -hmm. next. Then Councillor Maracas, Councillor Gardner, on the amendment. Let's keep it brief. So, and then Mayor Dahl. On the amendment, uh, I'd like to remind everybody that Flurry Park is a floodplain, and so putting a structure on there would not work. Uh, we've gone over this multiple times. Uh, Councillor Abel's new idea, where are we going to get the money from? I mean, the last thing I want to do is start spending money like a drunken sailor. Um, we don't know where the, the funds are coming from. We have an option to provide something that's very much needed. Um, council as a whole turned that down last term. You know, I disagreed with that decision then. I still disagree with it now. 
we need to move forward uh, on building something that meets the needs of our residents today and in the future. A tennis bubble will do that. A tennis bubble will do that at, you know, it makes the town money as opposed to it costing us a penny. So for me, Mr. Chair, um, this one is a no-brainer then, it's a no-brainer now. We need to move forward with this. And so I'll wait to hear the, the other uh, comments around the table, but I am definitely looking forward to, to voting against this amendment. Councillor. Councillor. Councillor Maracas, and again, to the amendment, and let's be brief, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, to the amendment, uh, I have specific l issues with the amendment as far as uh, what the CAO mentioned and what our, our solicitor mentioned, that um, I don't see how we can move forward with this amendment, and I don't see how it can be in order for us to deal with it as, fa as far as that it changes the terms of our RFP, which means that we would have to re-put re out an RFP to, to deliver those um, asked by Councillor Abel, so I just don't see how we can actually discuss this amendment and have this forward. We, my mind, we would have to defeat this if Councillor Abel is that is that was his intentions. Um, so, you know, I'm not in, I'm not in favor of even talking about this amendment actually. So, but um, like I said earlier, I'm I'm in favor of moving forward with a bubble. Thank you. Please, thank you, and Councillor Gartner, then Mayor Daw. And then we have Councillor Abel for a second time. Oh, I think I just need to, through somebody to through you, Mr. Chair, to clarify this. Um, the motion before us that came from Council on December eighth was for staff to report back on options. Does, does Councillor Gardner, are you speaking to the amendment that Councillor Abel put forward? Well, I just need to know. It, yes. In that, I need to know what's on the table. Do we have an RFP on the table? Through you to Mr. Downey. Through you, Mr. Chair. We have an expired RFP on the table, and uh, but we have the terms and conditions that were identified within that uh, expired RFP uh, before you. council. Thank you, Mr. Downey. We don't have an RFP on the table, just to make this very clear. We have uh, comments from staff. Um, we, we haven't gone out to do an RFP process. Uh, speaking to the amendment, um, we have to do something for the tennis people. That's very clear. Um, I agree with Councillor Abel to tie up our very valuable and uh, very small amount of rec land for 20 years for a bubble at the SARC, it's, it doesn't make sense to the community. I, I, there's, there's no doubt we have to help the tennis community. But this proposal that's before us does not make sense to me. And uh, it went round and round in council last term. And many times we asked for a multi-use facility. And we just never got there. And then the election came upon us. So. Um, We must be very careful not to do something in haste that will be detrimental to the entire community and, and potentially to the tennis community in the future. Mayor Daw, speaking to the amendment, please. And speaking to the amendment, Mr. Chair, thank you very much. Um, I, I wanna speak, Councillor uh, Gartner mentioned multi-use. We never actually gave any direction to staff as to what that multi-use would be, uh, so. Um, we can't ask, it's not appropriate to ask staff to interpret what our concept of multi-use would be. So unless we're actually going to give Mr. Downey that direction, I don't think we can bring that up. Fleury Park's the floodplain. Councillor Peary already mentioned that. That was the, uh, the whole issue last time. I was intimately involved with that. The, uh, the Conservation Authority just flat would not allow anything to be built there, any structure. We couldn't even, uh, Mr. Downey, correct me if I'm wrong, we can't even change the washrooms over there, can we? But through you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Downey. So you, uh, Mr. Chair, that's correct. We have to do renovations. We can't do any reconstruction, which is a little frustrating. So I will, uh, there is just, I just can't support the amendment. Thank you very much for being brief. Councillor Kim, to the amendment, and please be brief. Uh, 
Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. So to the amendments, um, I can't support either. I, I, I think it was like 60 pages of uh, historical reading, and, and that's what it stated. It's a floodplain, so I can't, for that reason, I can't support it. But just, uh, if you would humor me, just one quick question uh, through you to uh, Mr. Downey. Um, I, I do realize I, I, I want to ensure that uh, something is, is made for the next winter so that it is available for tennis. Can you tell us, so that we know our timelines, when is, is there a drop dead date or a certain date that we need to sign the papers in order that the contractor can go ahead and build it in time? Uh, do you have a rough time frame or, or a, a date so that for our FYI? Mr. Downey? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the proponent would like to be able to be in a covered facility by September. Um, the, you're probably looking at about a three month construction period. So you advance to that, we're probably into June. Um, so um, we also have to enter into an agreement, which is why this is before council. Um, we need to do those negotiations, enter into agreement. Um, the uh, proponent then needs to secure contractors and would like to be able to commence construction certainly in May or, or June. I would, you know, I would, I would uh, in, in this area, I'd gladly leverage the perspective of my fellow council members. My personal feeling on this is that I don't, I also agree that the Stronic site is not the ideal site, but for purposes of time and uh, expediency to, to give the tennis people what they want, if, if everyone else is in agreement that that's the right location, I'm all for that. But my amendment would, if I were to put an amendment out there, and I'm not, suggesting it unless uh, others would be willing to do so that uh, you know whether it be uh, you know a, a lot's been recently made available six acres uh, not too far away and uh, some of the residents there have been open-minded about that uh, for fear of the alternative and so I think there's been a couple of other options that that's been put on the table and if it's not if and if within you know a couple of weeks we can we can really assess properly what is the true uh, uh, preferable location without having to uh, miss our timelines. I'd be open to, to having staff really take a second look at the ideal location. Um, if no one else around the table is in agreement with that, then that's fine, but I just want to put that out there. Thank you, Councillor Kim. Last word on the amendment is to you, Councillor Abel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just so that we're very clear, I'm, I'm all for putting a bubble in. I mean, uh, I, just, I just thought a location, if we had options, and I'm glad Councillor Kim brought up uh, Mavernac, uh, because you could put courts in there, put a bubble up uh, for the winter, and then remove it in, in, in the summer. And I think that's, that makes sense, because then you get to use those courts all summer. Uh, it's also been identified that we have no tennis courts in the 2Bs and 2Cs. So it's an ideal spot to go, and I thank Councillor Kim for bringing it forward. I think my amendment really speaks to an alternative. Uh, Flurry Park seemed natural to me, but based on what Councillor Kim has said, uh, we can go to another location and put it in very quickly and, and fulfill what that obligation is to our tennis community and to the Timberline uh, members that have, uh, have been closed out they, they, and need a place to play in the winter. And, and I, it's been identified in our master plan that we need more courts. So there's a lot of materials that says we have to do this. I just think uh, another location is what we should do. So my amendment was specifically Flurry Park, thinking that a temporary bubble would satisfy the conservation. If it doesn't, we can look at Hallmark, Mavernac. I mean, we wouldn't put it in the town park because we'd say, well, why would you put it in an area that doesn't suit that area for the long-term plans and what we do? And I think it's the same with the SARC. I mean, we've done a big study on sport tourism and there's a hotel coming in right on Leslie Street, hopefully. And this speaks to putting in a facility that could house a number of volleyball courts, a number of basketball courts, and a number of tennis courts. So that's what I'm thinking we should do with the SARC. And I'm just asking for a quiet reflection to think about it because it's right now in the dead of winter and to put in a facility he could build just as easily in Mavernac or Hallmark as he could on the SARC. But the SARC is strategic in our master plan and our long-term sport tourism. And to put a, a bubble in a 20-year lease really 
if we just move it, we, we can do it that way. And I really, I really think I should be clear on that. Um, it's best for everyone, tennis community, the community, sport, tourism, overall, I think if we move to another location, that's all I'm saying. Thank you, Councillor Abel. Councillor Humphreys has a quick question with regards to the amendment. Not to the amendment. Um, we're talking about changing uh, a suggested location. Can I ask the, the director why we selected it in the first place if it's such a bad spot? Mr. Downey. Why do we select this spot? Through you, uh, Mr. Chair, with regards to the selection of um, Stuart Burnett Park, um, the time when we uh, called the RFP, um, uh, Council asked us to look at alternative locations to Fleury Park, um, and uh, we had identified um, Stuart Burnett Park as, a, as an appropriate alternative, and that was approved by Council. So we are moving forward with the direction of Council at, the, at this particular time. The reason that, Fleury, that uh, Stuart Burnett Park um, uh, works well is, uh, first of all, it's a community park, and so it's a community facility. There is uh, parking already available, so the, the need for additional parking is uh, somewhat minimized, although uh, with the um, continued development of, uh, of Stuart Burnett Park, there more than likely will be additional parking put in. There are other facilities available there that would support this. Um, we are in a situation where um, um, I've identified a location beside a ball diamond um, and we are always concerned with regards to foul balls coming out of the ball diamond and into the park and so we have identified a location that um, uh, a bubbled facility or a covered facility would minimize any impact uh, uh, to any a patron using the facility which is the reason we were looking at a bubble facility and the bubble remaining for the entire year. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate that because it, it confirms all the conversations for the last four years, five years on this. We had tons of conversation on this. And there was reasons we picked this site. So I don't support the motion. Thank you. I'll now ask the clerk to read out the amendment and then we will vote. Uh, thank you. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, the amendment is to add the words uh, at Fleury Park uh, for five years to the end of the second clause so that the, the effects of the, the amendment will be that the second clause would read that staff be directed to prepare a lease agreement with 849400 Ontario Inc. for the provision of an indoor tennis facility at Fleury Park for five years. All those in favor of the motion? Okay. Mr. Chair. I, if, if it was any other location, at another location rather than Fleury Park. Your amendment was moved and seconded, Councillor Abel, as Fleury Park. And I'm not allowed to make an amendment, an amendment called, to the amendment? At this point, we've called the vote on your amendment. It's got multiple discussion. All those in favor as the amendment, as the clerk has read, opposed, that, mo that amendment is defeated. Back to the main motion. And again, Council, if you don't like the main motion, we can always defeat it and refer it back to staff. Going back to the main motion, I had next, uh, Mayor Daw. Speaking to the main motion, um, so Mr. Downey answered whether or not it's a good site. I happen to agree that it's a, a good place for this. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Fleury Park, I don't believe is on because of requirements of the uh, Conservation Authority. There, I was actually had a chat with someone today with respect to domes and the cost of, of putting a dome up and taking it down runs into thousands of dollars. So, I, you know, if you want to put that into something, I think that needs to be taken into consideration. A five year, it's interesting, we talked about a five year lease. I, I suggested that for the soccer club, we have a five year lease uh, where we, we go through and organize leases and um, council turned it down. They wanted to give the soccer club um, a longer horizon. I don't think you can ask someone to put out the amount of money that uh, this proponent has has, uh, has spoken of, of putting up and give them a five-year lease. I just don't think that's, that's appropriate. Uh, I've been in favor of this since it came to council in December, or pardon me, April of 2014, that's so almost two years. Um, quite frankly, not much has changed. Uh, so I do support the recommendation that is on the floor. I think we need to move ahead. Uh, in, in the long term, if there was changes to be made, um, if we decided that we wanted to have, we wanted to double the size of the hockey pads, so I had two more hockey pads at, uh, or ice rinks, pardon me, at uh, the SARC, then maybe you think about, well, if we do that, we take out the, the one ice surface at 
the family leisure complex and move tennis there. I don't know. I think you can probably look at some alternatives down the road, but I believe um, what most of the, uh, the people in the audience here are interested in tonight, and certainly what I'm interested in, is moving forward. I don't believe that, um, that going back and asking Mr. Danny to go back and, and look at things, whether it's Maverinac, because you're gonna have to have public meetings around putting something like this in at Maverinac, because I don't think that that would be uh, overly popular right off the start anyways. I think you would have to go through that process. That's just gonna delay where we wanna be next fall. Uh, so I will support the recommendations on the floor. I believe we've, uh, we've spoken of this long enough. I believe the reasons are solid and I will support it. Thank you, Mary Daw. I have Councillor Peary, then Councillor Humphreys, then Councillor Tom. Mr. Chair, uh, you know, I, I don't find myself typically being a, um, somebody who, who agrees with people because they're out in the audience. Uh, typically the way I make my decisions on, you know, my gut and what I think is right. And without a doubt, uh, Mr. Chair, I reiterate time and time again, the decision we made last term was wrong and this is the right decision and that's what I'd like to move forward on. Thank you, Councillor Perry. Councillor Humphreys. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just very briefly, I support uh, the current motion on the table. Thanks. Councillor Tom. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, I support it as well, but uh, I, I have a couple of questions. Um, I wasn't on council last term. I understand, based on what Mr. Downey just said, why the location was, was chosen. There's a current baseball diamond. I'm looking at page 33 of the report. It's, it's in the attachments. But there's also some drawings about an additional future multi-use field and stuff. So perhaps, Mr. Downey, if you could comment, is that kind of still on your radar, turning in uh, page, I guess it's page 33, um, uh, what looks to be another multi-use field beside the current location that we're talking about? Mr. Downey. Through you, Mr. Chair, with regards to the multi-use field, we've engaged the services of a landscape architect. We are moving forward with construction drawings and we have approval for construction of that facility. Uh, it was dependent upon the decommissioning of the stormwater management pond, um, which was tied into the development of the, of, uh, the 2C um, a planning district. That has been completed. So we are presently moving forward with the design and we'll be moving forward with tender drawings uh, and construction of that facility um, as soon as we possibly can. Thank you, Mr. Downey. So as we, as we speak, we're kind of already in motion by putting some, some facilities in that location as well, whether we move forward with this or not. And uh, my other question is on, regarding the SARC. If we do move forward with this, is it, uh, isn't it possible that we can expand the SARC um, this would be expanding it north if we if we we're going to put a, a different multi-use facility or expand the building. But can we can we not expand the building to the east or sorry to the west and to the southwest of the of the Sark? Was not am I not am I mistaken in understanding that the building can be expanded along those axes as well? Mr. Downey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, really, the only possibility of expansion is either to the north or to the east. Um, to the to the west and to the south, you are you restricted with um, uh, um, open space. Um, there is an opportunity for additional construction on the Sark um, in the um, in the south uh, west corner. Um, however, it it limits to about six thousand square feet. Thank you, Councillor Kim. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor, for reminding us of uh, you know, all the processes that we would have to go through if we did have to look at al alternative uh, sites. And uh, given that you know, we all want to, to have, have uh, a tennis facility available by, by the fall, uh, I'd be totally in favor. Um, just one request, uh, Mr. Downey, uh, if you could look into maybe perhaps getting like maybe look into neutral colors or maybe like an accent wall or something like that because all the domes are pure white and it'd be nice to have something a little bit different something aesthetically more pleasing can you can you check with the design channel to see if there's any uh serious chair i <laughs> certainly I, I have no idea whether they're available but i can certainly talk to proponent and find if there's anything available um any other further Questions or comments? Councillor Abel, Councillor Gardner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, through you, if we were to put the bubble 
would we be able to expand uh, two more ice pads? Mr. Downey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. If you uh, chose to um, uh, move forward with the bubble and, uh, uh, and wanted to then expand uh, ice pads in the SARC and you wanted to go to the north, you would need to uh, decommission the, the bubble uh, and those fields as well as the multipurpose field which is going to be constructed as well. So that would, uh, that would require two facilities to be, to be uh, demolished in order to permit the construction of additional ice pads to the north. Um, could you say that again, please? Certainly. You can't go north with two additional soccer fields without destroying the soccer field and the tennis ball bubble, if that's clearer. So uh, you can't move these two facilities, the all-purpose turf and the soccer bubble further north, so that it would allow that expansion? I mean, wouldn't it be prudent to do that? or consider it through you, Mr. Chair? Do you, Mr. Chair, the tennis bubble could be moved further north. However, the soccer field could not, or the multi-purpose field could not. So um, with the construction of the multi-purpose field, it will limit council's ability to expand the um, SARC for ice pads to the north. Um, however, we could, if you wish, relocate the tennis court further north, um, closer to uh, the 2C development. Um, the, the th correct me if I'm wrong, uh, weren't we always able to, in the design of the SARC, accommodate two additional pads? Mr. Downey. Through you, Mr. Chair, when we, when we designed and constructed the SARC, we did that with the uh, uh, thought that if we wished to move forward with additional construction or ad additions to the SARC, whether it be to the south um, west corner or uh, to the north with additional rinks, that was going to be uh, uh, available to council if they so choose. Um, well, I mean, I, I've, I've heard enough comments around the, um, around the table that uh, looking for another location uh, is not going to be considered at this time. Uh, council has resolved to, to put it at the SARC. So uh, that'll be that, and I have no further comment. I, I thought we would consider another location uh, or at least be given the option to consider other locations. Uh, since we're not being given that option um, and council is not going to consider it, I, I will uh, oppose it, but uh, I am in support of a bubble for the tennis people, and I'm glad that uh, we are moving and um, making a decision. Councillor Gardner, then Councillor Marakis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is a very interesting situation, especially as indoor tennis isn't usually under the municipal umbrella. Um, but with the closing of Timberlane, it makes the, the concern uh, much more pressing. And tennis is certainly very popular in Aurora. Uh, and it's, it's gone through a resurgence recently, actually. Uh, I have a couple of concerns. The first concern is uh, I do not want to tie up this land for 20 years with a bubble. I don't think it's prudent. Uh, I don't think it's the right thing to do. Um, my second concern is um, we haven't passed our, uh, our recreation master plan yet. And our recreation master plan says quite a lot about tennis. So I, I, I really would have liked to slow down the process, uh, especially as winter. Next winter is a long way away. And that's why I supported uh, Councillor Abel's motion of trying to find an alternative that would really uh, help the tennis people and uh, serve the community and be smart going into the future and watch our taxes. And I don't know if there is such an answer. Um, I don't think what we have before us is the right way to go. I will be voting against it. Um, not because I don't want to provide the service to all of the people who are sitting in the audience, but because I just don't think it's the right way to go. And um, I'd like to take a little more time. I'd like to look at the REC master plan. I'd like to 
discuss it at council, hasn't been discussed at council. I'd like to find out what alternative there is, and I definitely would like to have indoor tennis for you next year. I just don't think this is the right way to go. Thank you, Councilor Gardner. Before I go to Councilor Maracas and Mayor Daw, I have a question for my uh, for you. Um, in our in our report on page 39, you have a report from April 1st, 2014. It's PR 14-06. In there was the recommendation to um, for the RFP with regards to the the same numbered company that's on the screen. Is the motion before us tonight, in essence, the same outcome as? what you put forward in the April 1st, 2014 report, setting aside the fact that one calls for an RFP and the other one doesn't. It seems to be that in some ways, this is a reconsideration of something that happened back in April of 2014, as Mayor Daw alluded to. Gee, Mr. Chair, you're correct. It is uh, essentially that agreement being executed. Thank you. So it, it's been before us before. It's now two years later. And similar to Mayor Daw, I supported it then, and I support it now. Councillor Maracas for the second time, Councillor uh, uh, Mayor Daw, then Councillor Gartner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, through you to Mr. Downey, um, are, is the town in need of extra ice pads? Mr. Downey? Through you, Mr. Chair, um, the council has been in receipt of the draft uh, Parks and Recreation Master Plan. Uh, the master plan had indicated, or the draft master plan, excuse me, which hasn't been approved by council, um, recently has uh, indicated that there is not a need or will not be a need for additional ice pads um, and um, has not made a recommendation as to building additional pads uh, in the near future. Thank you, and uh, through you, Mr. Chair, to Mr. Downey, um, has it been um, identified that there's a need for a tennis facility, indoor tennis facility? Through you, Mr. Chair, um, the need for a tennis facility has not been identified as a requirement in the existing Parks and Recreation Master Plan, and it hasn't been identified as a requirement in the, in the draft Parks and Recreation, Recreation Master Plan, other than the draft master plan that is before you now has indicated a process that Council should enter into with regards to provision of that facility if Council so chooses. Um, the genesis of this indoor facility, as you know, came from the Aurora Community Tennis Club outside of, the, outside of any recommendations that were presented to Council from the Parks and Recreation Master Plan. Staff have proceeded with the provision of this facility at council's direction. Thank you. I'll be. I'll try to make a brief. Um, uh, I think uh, supplying um, a service to our residents that, um, in essence, does not add a tax burden to them, is a no-brainer in my mind. I think um, we, you know, we put the bubble there. We, we provide that service to the tennis community that they need, so dearly need, and while that is in place, we take our time and we look at areas where we can put a multi-use facility that we're, that we're looking for and that has been identified in our master plan instead of stopping the progress of this and then rushing to build something and spend money to build and at the end of the day might not be the proper thing to do. So here we are with an option in front of us to build something that's not going to cost us, once again, I, I mean, to me, it's a no-brainer. Let's build it. Let's, let's supply our tennis community with indoor tennis for this winter. I, I mean, well, not this winter, for next winter. I, I mean, I just don't see it as any other thing than to say yes to this. Mayor, thank you. Mayor Dahl. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just quickly through you to Mr. Downey. Uh, I'm just looking at the SARC on Google Earth, and um, it looks to me that if you're going to extend it, you'd put probably the two ice pads, two new ice pads, if that was the way to go behind the, the two current ones, which would actually take out the ball diamond too. Uh, so perhaps, uh, and, but I, I'm not familiar with what the original plan was, so perhaps between now and next week, because my suspicion is that this will be discussed again next week, you could uh, bring back uh, some drawings 
just a, you know, even a, just a rough sketch as, as to what that expansion might look so that people can, so the council can have a, a better sense of, of uh, where that might fit in. Uh, so I, that's just a request for next week. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Gardner, for the second time. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you, uh, perhaps the best person would be Mr. Downey. Um, we're not going to have any construction costs with that, this. Are we going to have any operating responsibility, staffing, program development, advertising, anything like that? Mr. Downey? Through you, just one moment, please. Um, if you go to page 108, um, the scope of the um, RFP has been identified. Um, and to answer your question directly, there are no capital costs incurred by the municipality. There are no operating costs incurred by the municipality. Uh, there are no program or marketing costs incurred by the municipality. Um, this is all on the proponent. Thank you. And, and I, they will be paying the taxes. That's, <laughs> I was going to say, I thought I saw that in the report. I'm glad that they're going to be paying the taxes. I mean, I don't know if I'm going to want to rehash this at council. I see the will at the table. I want the residents to be happy. Uh, so at the end of the day, I'll be voting in favor of this. Councillor Humphreys, then Councillor Cam. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just some comments made earlier. I just, uh, um, there was a comment made that, you know, tennis supporting or providing tennis facilities is not um, part of the municipality obligation where in fact we did try to get a Trillium grant and we were turned down by Trillium because they did see it as a municipality obligation to provide that type of facility. So that was turned down back in 2012, I believe. And then in 2014, we had a, uh, an opportunity to look at other um, indoor multi-purpose facilities that were not bubble, not air supported. And I voted in favor of that because I thought it was uh, very valuable to provide a, a tenants facility plus all other uh, uses. It came back to us at over seven million and 150,000 a year in operating costs and who knows what else on top of that. At the end of the day, there was a lot of tax burden for us and no trillion grants to be extended. So uh, looking at this proposal, again, that came back is coming back to us uh, virtually the same at no tax burden and uh, providing a great um, facility for tennis users and also in terms of you know the the win-win for our or uh, for our municipality i'm in absolute favor of this at this point thank you councillor kim thank you mr chair you know this weekend i think tennis and, and uh, tree management has been on my mind uh, all weekend i don't think i'd, I'd, I'd be thinking about those items for such a long time, but um, I'm, I'm prepared to vote on this at next week's council to approve and move forward. When I look at the risk reward of, of this project, uh, it's pretty neutral and ba balances out in my mind that uh, I don't see any huge risk down the road. Uh, however, it was, it, it was brought up a couple times about uh, the length of the, uh, the lease and uh, potential future needs. Uh, just, just for uh, just to ensure that you know all the um, everything uh, under the carpet's been looked at and, and so forth. Uh, for for council next week, would you be able to provide some numbers with respect to uh, if if we had a ten-year lease and a buyout? As everyone knows, when you lease a car or, um, or do anything, uh, all you have to do is really pay back um, the costs and put in some of the profit uh, to put back into the builder to uh, uh, if, we, if we wanted an early option to uh, do something after 10 years or something like that. Uh, so would you be able to provide uh, maybe a couple of scenarios in terms of if we did uh, uh, do a 10-year lease and option to purchase in terms of all the building costs, how much that would cost, or uh, that type of scenario for us uh, for next council? Mr. Downey? To you, Mr. Chair, if I might, um, and correct me if I'm wrong on any of this, but I don't believe I'm going to be, but um, if you wish to enter into any discussions with regards to anything outside of their, the RFP that has been presented to you, which is a 20-year lease, um, then I would recommend that um, we get direction from Council, first of all, to enter into negotiations, uh, so we need to get approval that we enter in discussions with that particular proponent. 
Um, I can then have discussions with that particular proponent and then get back to council stating what impacts that may have on, uh, on the um, agreement um, if there was a shorter term. Uh, I suspect that there will be some financial implications with regards to that, but I can't state that for sure. But I do feel uncomfortable negotiating with a proponent that council has not engaged. That's fine. Seeing no further questions, I will now call the question. All those in favor of the motion in front of us? Opposed? Motion carries. <laughs> for those in the audience, the item will be back before council next week for uh, final approval. We'll now move on to our second favorite conversation, <laughs> trees. <laughs> item 11 was pulled by Mayor Daw, and as I asked previously, I would ask that you put forward one of the alternatives as part of the recommendation. Mayor Daw. Apologies, Mr. Chair. Um, I appreciate your point of view. My motion would be that the report simply be received for information. So if that's not acceptable to the chair, someone else will have to move it. My concern is that uh, we'll just delay the conversation and go around a few extra times. So if somebody is prepared to put forward a recommendation with one of those alternatives, Councillor Gardner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move option one. Could you read option one, please? Could I read option one? I could. Or alternative one, as it's called. Oh, maybe I did this wrong. Fine. Yes. As an alternative to including the City of Markham clause pertaining to golf courses, businesses, Council could revert back to the original proposal draft tree protection bylaw of uh, tree, sorry, draft tree protection language requiring a permit to be obtained by a golf course prior to removing more than 10 trees in 12 months. Actually, I would just like to make the motion that we move back to the original draft tree bylaw period. Well, You'd like to move an alternative that is not in the report? Can we just try with alternative one first? Yeah, I think, uh, okay, let's, let's put alternative one on the table. Thank you. Do I have a seconder for alternative one? Councillor Humphreys. Mayor Don, you're just a point of clarification, Mr. Chair. Isn't alternative one contrary to the to the second clause? Clerk, Mr. Clerk. Uh, thank you, uh, 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 through you, Mr. Chair. I would suggest it's not because the second clause is. So you might recall that when this matter was before uh, council in the uh, late fall, just for the Christmas season, uh, we were requested to come back with terms that were similar to Markham's bylaw. We're recommending, having now looked more fully at that, that we actually don't include those in the bylaw, so now we're looking for an alternative. So that second clause takes out the Markham terminology, and the th new third clause will put in different terms pertaining to golf courses, so it's not contrary. In so in essence, the, the, the alternative on the floor is that uh, um, golf courses would require a permit to remove more than 10 trees in a 12-month period. That is the alternative that was put on the floor. Mayor Daw, would you like to speak to it? The motion in whole. It's fine. Councillor Gardner. Uh, Mr. Mayor, we started this process in uh, the year 2010. Uh, we tasked staff to come back with a draft tree protection bylaw or a, a new draft tree bylaw. Uh, we put together a multi-department committee. They did a lot of work. They were very pleased with uh, the amount of work that they did and what they were able to bring before council and I think that was the year 2012. Um, and council kept sending it back and we've been sending it back and it is now 2016 and 
I think it's time for the council to make a decision. Do we want to bring trees on golf courses that are under the size of a woodlot into the municipal jurisdiction? This is being done in many municipalities, if not all municipalities, and uh, it's the time. Uh, you know, let's answer the question. Are we ready to want to protect trees on golf courses from destruction? And, uh, the, and going back to the original bylaw, we're, we're allowing 10 trees. So it's not that the golf courses cannot remove trees for certain purposes. They just can't remove a lot of trees without coming to the town and uh, justifying it. Councillor Peary. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I've got a question for Mr. Downey. Um, first, a little bit of background. This whole issue was brought up because uh, a golf course in town cut down some trees. Residents weren't happy. Through you to Mr. Downey, Mr. Chair, uh, does this bylaw prevent what happened from happening again? Mr. Downey. Through you, Mr. Chair, no, it doesn't. Um, since that particular golf course is subject to the regional tree bylaw and not subject to this tree bylaw. Thank you. So. For the last uh, two or three years, we've gone around the merry-go-round trying to solve a problem, uh, which ultimately we aren't able to solve uh, in this means or through these means. Um, in doing so, we've decided that there is a problem in town with our residents cutting down between three and four trees. So we're going to make a decision that three to four trees is too many now they're only allowed to cut down two without a permit. To my knowledge, that was never a problem in the first place. Uh, it's not a problem moving forward. Um, so throughout this whole process, what have we accomplished in my view? Not a whole lot. Uh, we're going to make our residents' lives a little bit more frustrating for those who want to cut down three trees. And as Mayor Dawes pointed out many times, He's planted a lot more trees on his property than three, and we're telling him he can't, down, he can't cut down the trees that he's already planted a few years ago. Um, I'm you know, frustrated for me that we've gone through this process, uh, and, and in my view, we're sort of back to where we were. I'm okay with our first bylaw. Um, I don't see, you know, we've gone through all of this, I don't see what it accomplishes truly and really. Uh, I have a quote that I saw um, earlier and I found it pertinent. Um, it's by the great Groucho Marx. And the quote is that politics is the art of looking for trouble, finding it everywhere, diagnosing it incorrectly and applying the wrong remedies. And that Mr. Mayor and Mr. Chair is what I feel like we've done for the last two or three years. Thank you, Groucho. <laughs> Councilor Maracas. Sure. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, we do put regulations in place. I mean, I, I mean, to go to your point, Councilor Perry, when if we take uh, uh, your train of thought, maybe we should remove uh, uh, the regulations when it speaks to a heritage designation on houses and just allow people to rip them down. Well, you know what? It's their house. Let them do it. Why should we regulate it? So, you know, uh, this is about protecting trees at the end of the day. And I think, um, you know, regardless of, of if you planted them or if you didn't, uh, we're looking to protect them and looking to protect that canopy within our town. So um, I, I agree. We've talked about this enough. I've only been here for one year of discussions for this, and I think it's too much. Um, quite frankly, I think we should just end the discussion and just vote on it and let it be where it, like, you know, let the vote fall where it, where it falls and let's just see where we go forward. Uh, I'm in favor of the alternative that's been put forward by Councilor Gardner and so I'll be supporting it. I have Councilor Humphreys and Councilor Tom. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, similar to Councilor Maracas and Councilor uh, Gardner, let's just bring back the original draft. Uh, we brought it up for a reason. 
it may not make sense to some, it makes sense to me to discuss each area and vote on it once and for all and just put it away after that and everyone has their opinion and they can state it. And just for the record, I have been accused of cutting trees on my property to build my addition and I have not cut down one tree. And you can go and see them crawling on top of the roof of that addition where they have begged me to, that they would not survive and so far they're doing a great job. Councillor Tom. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm not in favor of the recommendation on the floor. And I've had a lot of time to think about this, and I'm glad it's come back. Um, golf courses golf courses don't need any more regulations than they are already forced to go through. Golf is in decline in this province. And we're talking about having a golf course uh, summit uh, for the development of golf courses. And yet we're, on the other hand, hampering golf courses with more bureaucratic red tape, uh, making it harder for them to conduct their business. If they have to come into town council to remove trees, uh, more than 10 trees, maybe uh, it adds to their uh, economic viability. I'll, I'll give you an example. There's a golf course that's not particularly in Aurora, but it's, uh, it's near here. Uh, their greens were dying. The, there was, I don't know what was wrong with them, but they needed to, to remediation. One of the things that they had to recommend in order to remediate the greens was to cut trees down around the greens. Uh, they needed airflow, they needed sunlight. Um, they weren't cutting them down to, uh, for fun. It was for the economic viability of the golf course and also be responsive to its members. Um, they removed the trees, the situation was remediated, and the golf course is flourishing. It is, it is doing well economically. Uh, and if you, if you golf that course, I won't name it, but if you golf it, it, it there must be thousands of trees. There's so many trees. I mean, golfers love trees. It's aesthetically pleasing. It's why people play golf. If you wanted to golf at a cow pasture, you would do it. No one does that. The good courses have a ton of trees. The courses know that they're important for their economic viability, uh, which is why the term cow pasture even exists. So I don't think it's necessary. I agree with Councillor Peary. Are we fixing a problem that doesn't exist? I mean, cutting down trees on a golf course to help with the, the, the health of that course and the economic viability as a business, to me, uh, is paramount, especially in, a, in an atmosphere, especially in this province right now, where golf courses need all the help they can get to not turn into a housing development. So I think that uh, this is a bit, the alternative on the floor is too punitive and golf courses already manage their trees. Uh, they don't need the municipality to tell them how to do it. Thank you, Councillor Tom. Just if I can add my own comments for a moment before we go around again. You know, I've stated in the past that, you know, while I have no issue with requiring a golf, cor golf course to require a permit, I do have a, a, an issue with restricting them to 10 trees a year. Um, as Councillor Tom uh, indicated, I do think it's punitive. You know, we're seeing with the Highland Gate development, you can have hundreds of homes circling a golf course. Um, and if only a small, small fraction of those homes chose to ch cut down a tree, they would in the end, you know, cut down more trees than we're allowing a whole golf course. You know, it goes back to the same issue time after time. If we're going to do it, let's make it fair, let's make it equitable. And 10 trees for a golf course of that size is not equitable when you can look at all the homes surrounding it can cut down more. If we're truly worried about canopy and preservation, then let's make a rule that's equitable for both commercial as well as residential. And, and that's the issue I have with it. I don't have an issue with, with golf courses being included into it, but I think 10 is too punitive. For the second time. Sorry, my apologies, Sorry. Councillor Abel. Councillor Abel, you're up, then Mayor Dahl. I always like weighing in on this uh, because uh, it, protecting trees is why we're going to tell golf courses they, they have to, to abide by a 10 tree. Uh, they, are, they are stewards. We did a natural asset. It shows the woodlots. It shows the next canopy is golf courses. They are, they are a natural agent to protecting trees. They have to manage their golf courses to attract people and stay in business. And uh, it, it's, it's, uh, it's funny that we're, we're trying to uh, restrict them to look after and be good stewards to wildlife and, and all that they bring. Um, meanwhile, I saw a woodlot at St. John's and Leslie, I think the devastation was in the thousands of trees. And here they're gonna replace it with asphalt. And we're not, we're not saying a word about that. They're not replacing a tree either. Uh, the, the golf course uh, Beacon Hall that this all started out, because someone looked out their window in their backyard and saw the trees down on a winter's day. Um, 
they they have a flourishing i mean the trees are it's, it's incredible i show pictures to contrast how good it looked um, but they have green and wildlife there, whereas we have a road with thousands of trees going there. So if we truly are about protecting trees. There should be something said about the devastation on St. John's Side Road or um, Aurora Wellington School on Wellington where I pass by. They cut down a number of mature trees for a parking lot. And right here in our town hall, we cut down a number of mature trees. Uh, to give it a cleaner look uh, because there was overgrowth because it's let's face it trees are a renewable resource uh, It's one of the great resources we have here in Canada. We export lumber you build your homes you put hardwood If you want to protect trees the only people that do not use trees at all Are the only people that can say we should not be cutting down trees and uh, those are indigenous uh, Inuit uh, because they live in igloos and uh, there are no trees there. Um, but we all use trees, whether we're using coffee cups, we're reading books, uh, building our homes, our furniture, uh, hardwood floors. Uh, we want to protect the environment and that's why if you take down trees and the government allows it, you have to take it down in spots and replant and then they grow back. And uh, it's a science. Uh, they've got it down pat. It's been going on for decades here in Canada. Uh, 